Welcome to the New York Genome Center. Nice to see some familiar faces and some new friends. Thanks for coming out tonight. We have a great program for you. I'm Kathleen Kearns, the Vice President for External Affairs here at the Genome Center, and my staff works together with these brilliant scientists to bring you uh, these uh, evening talks, which are generously underwritten by the Pi Wacket Fund one of our trustees who gives us the money to make sure the Genome Center word can be spread to the community. So tonight you're here to hear about um, high-tech, low-cost, next-generation genomic sequencing. We have um, colleagues of ours who uh, we worked with over the years who have now gone on to start their own companies and um, develop some really interesting technology that they're going to talk to you about. And then, of course, our friend Chris Mason from um, Wild Cornell. Um, Sophie Dyer will um, follow um, Joe Pickerel, who will start our program. Joe uh, was one of the original faculty members of the New York Genome Center and now has gone on to uh, start his own very exciting new company. So we're very eager to hear more about it. Joe? I'm going to present first, and I'm also going to be sort of the, uh, the moderator for our discussion. Um, and so we have, a, we have a great program of uh, people doing amazing things uh, with uh, DNA. And so uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, the company GenCove that, uh, that we started here four floors up at the New York Genome Center. When I was here, uh, I started three and a half years ago, uh, we were starting to experience uh, th these massive drops in the cost of genome sequencing. Um, and and we, we, we realized, and what everyone realized, is that the, the information that's in each and every one of your cells uh, has a lot of information about, about you, about your history, sort of where your ancestors came from, about where your ancestors' ancestors came from, about how humans and Neanderthals interbred, on the one hand. Uh, it, it has information about who you are today, so it has information about what traits you might have, whether you have dark hair or light hair, or whether you're predisposed to schizophrenia, or you, whether you're predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in some of these early uh, experiments, uh, uh, we, uh, people have been bringing the price of getting this information down. <clears throat> and uh, the idea was that we would eventually get to uh, the $1,000 genome. Um, and the $1,000 genome was sort of this price point that, uh, the, that was supposed to make genomics uh, accessible. And what we were focusing on is not the, not the $1,000 genome, uh, but the $10 genome. Um, and so that, I feel, is the price point that makes it accessible not just to uh, doctors or to insurance companies, but to you and me and individual people um, uh, around the world, not just in the United States, but, uh, but everywhere. Uh, and so what this plot is showing uh, is over the years, starting in 2005 all the way over there on uh, the left to 2015 on the right, uh, instead of thinking, what's the cost of a genome, let's ask instead, how much of a genome can you sequence for $10? If we say that $10 is the price point uh, we think we should be caring about. Uh, and in 2005, uh, you could get uh, zero of a genome. Uh, it turns out that was not uh, a very useful uh, number. Uh, uh, but as you can see, there's been this exponential growth uh, in what, how much of a genome you can sequence for literally $10. Um, and so around 2015, we realized um, that uh, it, you could sequence about 15% of a genome, maybe not with uh, perfect accuracy, but you could sequence 15% of a genome for $10 in sequencing costs. And so this, is, this I think, is, uh, uh, this is an inflection point. This is, uh, 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 times are going to change. And so it, for, from our perspective, what's happening is it's, you know, this, we now have uh, that's a picture of a dial-up modem. I don't know if, if the, the younger people in the crowd may not recognize that. That's a phone, like what used to be a phone. Um, <clears throat> and uh, once enough people had these dial-up modems and were able to connect to this new system that was, a, that was emerging, connecting people across the world, uh, it cr uh, uh, there were all of a sudden new applications that were previously impossible. We had, you could search and find any piece of information uh, that had been indexed anywhere in the world uh, within, a, an, within a half a second. You could uh, connect with people across the world. Uh, uh, people in Paris could be having chats with people in New York or people in Atlanta. Uh, and you, you could buy and, and sell goods across the entire world. There's, once enough people were connected to this network, uh, entirely new uh, applications are possible. And so um, 
I think we're at that sort of uh, stage now with uh, genomics. If enough people are getting online, enough people are connecting to this type of network, uh, new types of, uh, uh, of applications and new types of tools are possible. And so maybe you can search the genome and ask, uh, what's my risk for, for a disease? And maybe that's uh, like an analogy in some loose sense to search on the internet. Or could you connect to people, not based on whether you went to the same high school, but whether you share pieces of, of DNA? And this is something that's uh, done, for example, by companies like Ancestry DNA uh, uh, very well, and it's very successful. And, and there are a number of other things that you could do, but what, what we thought is this is the time now to enable this new generation of, of genome-enabled uh, uh, applications. And so uh, we built a company called uh, GenCove uh, based around this, this principle. Um, and you can go there now, GenCove.com, check it out. And uh, you can order our sequencing kits. It's not $10 yet. Uh, it's fifty nine ninety nine, which is still isn't too bad. Um, or if there are a number of other companies that are out there, like 23andMe or Ancestry, you can upload your data and sort of connect to what we view as this new uh, network, uh, the new types of things that you can do uh, with DNA data. And so we've been building this, this sort of thing out. Uh, we use our inexpensive uh, sequencing technology for uh, ancestry analysis to try and, uh, to go backwards in time, see where your ancestors lived. We're sequencing your saliva. Uh, and so we get uh, bacteria and viruses and uh, whatever else is in your mouth. And so we do an analysis of uh, the microbiome as well, which is an example of not uh, information about your past, but information literally about what, uh, what's in the present right now. Um, and, and we do analyses of things like traits. So we, we came up with a, a, a genetic way of analyzing, analyzing sleep patterns to predict whether you're more of a morning person or an evening person. And as more and more people connect to this type of network, these types of predictions will get better uh, and better and better. Um, and so that's uh, 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 GenCove. Um, that's the sort of the vision is that there's a new uh, uh, there's a new technology that's connecting people in an entirely new way, and there are new uh, applications that are possible. And we're going to uh, build some of these applications, and, and we hope that you are going to build some of these applications. And so we're, our goal is to make this uh, uh, totally open and, and available, where people can build on top of this technology, uh, like the first uh, internet companies, like the first uh, uh, companies like that, that uh, take uh, an existing technology and, and make it accessible. But it needs these uh, sorts of the pioneers, the first people, the first person on the internet, what did they do, right? Um, There's nobody to, to Facebook with. Um, and so now I want to, to talk briefly with one of these uh, uh, pioneers, Jeremy uh, Chatin. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Jeremy Chatin. I'm actually director of development here at the New York Genome Center. So he's he was four floors up. I'm seven floors up. I've been here for about a year and a half, and it's just, uh, it's just one of the most fascinating places I've ever had the pleasure of spending time. And so uh, uh, I guess I wanted to ask, had you done a genetic test before? I had not. Um, I, I found, frankly, I found the price point a, a little bit of a turnoff on, you know, 23andMe. It was, and, and Ancestry.com, quite expensive. I had heard stories over the years, um, and my family is not like kind of secret keeping family, so I, I sort of felt like maybe I sort of knew what was going on as far as Ancestry went. And, uh, and so I guess that's kind of a touchy question. Did you know what was going on <laughs> Ancestry-wise? Are there uh, any horrible secrets in your uh, Well, I was closet? super psyched to try your program. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of the things I have to say is that it, you know, the way the kit was designed and the way the app is designed is just so user-friendly that uh, it really was a pleasure to uh, do that. So the story I'd always heard, because my father was a, a genealogy geek, Okay. And he actually hired a genealogist in the 1970s to track down our, or at least his side of, of the roots. And the story was that, that our name went back to the 12th century in the area that is now v Vienna, and that there was two brothers named Shatton something close to that, and that they had, uh, one had gone east and the other had gone south, and we were descended from the one who had gone east. So when I got my ancestry back and it showed that I was you know, I think it's 93% uh, Ashkenazi Jew from the area around Poland. Um, that seems to make perfect sense. Okay, so it, uh, it confirmed what you... Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And then there's a little Mediterranean, um, 
and a little northern European um, uh, area that, you know, I guess that's just, you know, from artifacts from other streams. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting because my mother's mother was actually born in New York. Mm -hmm. So, um, and was originally from uh, like white Russia area. So mm -hmm. that, but, but apparently it's all kind of the Ashkenazi is the strongest part. So I was glad to know that, that you know, I am who I think I am. <laughs> and I guess, so from, from our perspective, what are, what are the things that you would like to learn from your DNA? That, that, uh, that, what is it that you would, you would like to know from a genetic test? Well, I think uh, one thing I, I'm really intrigued by is the you know, like friending part of things where you can compare. Um, mm -hmm. My wife and I compared ours and see the overlap. And as there's like more people that I'm connected to in there, I think that'll be really interesting mm -hmm. to to see how things compare. Because you know, in the end, we're all we're all one people, mm -hmm. and um, you know, culturally, what does it mean that I have that much Ashkenazi? But somebody could be from the same area, but not be Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So uh, app idea for somebody out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, and. You know, I, I think uh, as far as, um, yeah, I'm not that interested in learning more about like my health risks, unlike a lot of people, because I feel like I'm controlling for the things I can control for mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to live healthily. And if there's something lurking there that I have to deal with in the future, I, I don't know if I want that hanging over my okay. head. I know that seems to be a lot of, of something that people are really interested in. Is knowing their health risks. But for and, you, you'd, um, you'd prefer not to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, feel, I feel like I know some based on family history. My my father's health wasn't good, and uh, my mother's health was pretty good, and you know, so I feel like. Um, but if that was offered, I would probably go for it. Okay. All right, in, so. in in the app, you know, if it was like an easy, new feature, I might check that out. Um, and uh, but I think it's sort of more about the way I like the way I like to think about this kind of. Genomics is connecting people, you know, sort of the A.J. Jacobs idea mm -hmm. of, you know, we're all cousins. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just think anything we can do to drive that point home, you know, that any divisions between us are, are strictly learned and are not instinctual and not inherited. And we should just, you know, try to overcome them. All right. Well, that's a good point to start. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks a lot for uh, sure. talking with me. I want to say that, so as, as you know, we offered to, to sequence some, some people in the audience. We have five sequencing kits uh, out at the, at, the, at the front desk there. And uh, if you check under your seat, and you, five people will have a post-it note that says free sequencing kit or something. Uh, if, you, if you have one of those, you win, and you come find us later out at the, uh, at the, uh, at the front desk. And so next up is, is, is Sophie Zaire. And so Sophie I've known for a long time. She was here at the New York Genome Center working in Eneve Ehrlich's lab. Um, and she is the, the CEO and co-founder of Play DNA, uh, which brings the Minion, uh, which I think we'll, we'll hear quite a bit about, a portable DNA sequencer into the classroom. Uh, and she founded this company and is a Runway Fellow at Cornell Tech and the Runway Startup Postdoc Program. Um, and she's been doing amazing uh, research with the, with the Minion and portable sequencing in forensics uh, and clinical uh, research and in, uh, and in basic research. And so uh, we look forward to your talk. Science class in high school. Um, I can't really remember that we talked about DNA and genomics a lot. Um, and that's also understandable um, because this field was back then really in its infancy. Um, so the genomics field um, has been really as in actu has been growing so rapidly, and it's also what Joe was was talking about um, in a really short period of uh, of time. So now we can sequence uh, whole genomes um, uh, via DTC companies like um, uh, GenCove. We can uh, monitor the environment. We can do pathogen surveillance. Um, so we can see live in a really high resolution, much higher than we were able to um, uh, with, with microscopes, for instance. Um, but the education system, especially for middle schools and high school, is lagging behind a little bit. 
Um, we really need to educate our next generation to become um, genomics literate. Um, so, and that is what, what PlayDNA is trying to do. Uh, and PlayDNA, in order to, uh, to explain to you uh, the methods PlayDNA is using in order to make the next generation um, uh, genomics literate, um, I have to actually take you back to my teenage years. Um, so I love biology, um, and, and it wasn't actually because of science class in high school uh, and reading all the books. Um, I love biology um, because of where I grew up. I was very fortunate uh, to actually experience biology hands-on, and I was triggered to ask questions and to be inquisitive. So I grew up in the Netherlands, um, and my parents were both veterinarians. My mother uh, focused on the pets, so the cats and the dogs, and my father uh, focused on cows. He was a cow specialist, he was obsessed with cows. And in order to, um, to tell you the story about him, uh, I need to tell you a little bit about cows too. Um, okay, so the dairy cow is a domesticated animal. Uh, and so over many, many years, um, it has been selected for the production of, uh, for, for the production of milk. Now, a normal ca cow, if it uh, provides for its calf, it produces around one gallon of milk a day. Currently, the, the dairy cows produce 10 gallons of milk a day. That's a lot. But some are actually producing even a little bit more. Now, of course, the farmers know that more milk is more money, so, and they are also very aware that genetics is a, is a big part of it. But there is a bottleneck. The bottleneck is that the cow produces only one calf a year. Can we speed it up? Yes, we can. Embryo transplantation. Now, my father heard about this and was actually the, was, um, uh, made more efficient uh, as a method uh, in the US, uh, and he wanted to start it in the Netherlands. Um, so, in order to do embryo transplantation, or let me tell you a little bit about embryo transplantation. Um, so, what you do is you trick a cow in order to release, instead of one egg, ten eggs. Yeah? And then, so you, you, you buy sperm from an amazing bull, you inseminate it, and you get fertilization. And then, these embryos are flushed out, frozen, and then transplanted into a, a, a carrier mum. Yeah? Um, so hoping that, that indeed you would get this high-production cow. Um, so my father wanted to do this in the Netherlands on, on site, on the farms. And um, so, uh, so you need for embryo transplantation, you need microscopes, you need um, glassware, you need tubes, you need uh, reagents. Um, so he would carry this all to the farm um, and would basically put it all on the kitchen table and transform a kitchen into a lab space. And here you can see a picture of this. <laughs> So you see the table, you see all the glassware, the microscope, and I love this picture because you can see this farmer's wife, she's in the background, and she's probably making tea for everybody, and the farmers are around, and even the kid um, is sitting there, and everybody is excited because they want to know uh, how many embryos the yield is. And so my father would also allow me to peek through the, through the microscope. And what I saw was a blob. <laughs> it looked like this. And the only thing I could do was ask my father, what is this? And he would patiently sit me down and he would explain it to me. He would, he would say, okay, these are two gametes, they fuse together and this is the start of life. The cell will divide and it becomes two and from two it goes to four and it will go on and divide and divide and divide until you see the early shapes of a calf and indeed months later you would see indeed the calf, which I could pet. And so this is very important for a child's education. It's not to learn so much everything via the book, of course, you have to learn also uh, from books, but also to present them something and, and let them experience it hands-on. Experiencing and, and uh, life and science and DNA hands-on is so important for, for the development of a, of, of, a, of a child's brain in order to make them inquisitive, ask questions. Then, only then, will knowledge be retained. And that's what you need for the rest of your life. <coughs> okay, but in order to see life, you need tools. And there are many tools in order to see life, and you also need guidance. Um, but the tools I'm going to talk to you today about is 
um, DNA sequencing, and, um, uh, and data science. The genome, and as Joe already pointed it out, is, is, is huge. So in order to infer information from a genome, from all those biological um, bits, you need computers in order to make that process more efficient. So you need to, a couple of lines of code. But that, that, is a, that is a vehicle. It's not a means to learn, learn data science. It's a, it's a vehicle in order to basically get to that answer. Okay, so I want to go back to my father. Um, because he, he was carrying all those microscopes to the farms, and he thought, okay, this can be done more efficiently. And um, uh, so, so he thought, okay, if I, uh, I can also make a portable lab. And so what he did, he um, went to a car dealer and he asked, can you build a portable lab in the back of my van? And that's what they did. In the back of this van, there is a bench space with a microscope and a fridge and, a, and, a, and liquid nitrogen. And he would drive it to the farms and make this whole process more efficient. And so this was, this was innovation, right? Constantly trying to think, how can we improve things? How can we make things faster? And innovation creates opportunity. Now, I promised to talk about DNA sequencing because I also came across this amazing innovation in genomics. And this was three years ago when I started in Unif Ehrlich's lab. Um, and so uh, I started working with the Menayan. And the Menayan is a portable DNA sequencer. I've actually I've got it with me today. It's really tiny. It's here in the box. Um, it's a portable DNA sequencer. You can put it in your purse, you can plug it into your computer, and you can start sequencing DNA. Wow. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a tiny device. And just to place it in context, this is an Illumina sequencer, uh, actually a picture from, from upstairs. Um, these devices are amazing. You get a lot of data um, very accurately. But you, know, you need professional um, people to operate them. And it's, it's huge. You can't really put that in your purse. You can see like, how tiny the Manayan is compared to these uh, devices. Um, so, but the Manayan is also cool, not only because you can take it everywhere, but also because it generates data real time. And this makes really the connection to the, to the generated data. The moment you start sequencing, you can see the data flowing on your computer screens. You really can see the sequencing of the DNA happening in real time. Um, and so you can sequence for one minute, two minutes, an hour, 48 hours. So this Menayan really created opportunities, and there are so many, and I'm only going to point out two. Um, so one of the examples you can use, um, you can sequence in remote areas in order to catch poachers and um, the, the trade, trading in the illegal meats. But they also went to Africa in order to, uh, for the Ebola surveillance, it was by a group in England. Um, but we used it for another purpose. Yaniv and I um, were uh, in 2015 um, uh, teaching a class at Columbia University, um, and this was mostly computer science students. And we said, okay, let's bring these portable DNA sequencing devices um, into the classroom and get computer science students to, to learn about the biological questions, to do the micropipetting, to basically apply these samples and to see the data flowing onto their computer screens. And this was, and you can see here a picture where it's a bit blurry, um, but where the students uh, are set, so you can set it up anywhere in any classroom. And this was a great success, and we won an award, and, and um, we basically published a paper, but Geneva and I sat down at some point, and we were thinking like, okay, undergrads already chose their direction, they already chose to become computer scientists, or genomicists, or molecular biologists. We might be able to make a bigger impact if we go to middle schools and high schools. That is a stage where the children are still to new ideas. We don't have to, 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 um, uh, to educate them in order to choose a career path in uh, genomics or data science, but at least that they are genomics literate and data science literate. They understand and they can make educated choices. And so Yaniv and I started PlayDNA. Um, and PlayDNA um, really uh, allows the student to learn about biology, learn about genomics, um, and do this, uh, all the data analysis um, themselves. And it's all hands-on. And it really fits into this uh, STEM mindset. So STEM, the idea behind STEM, um, is really in order to have this integrative thinking. So instead of having just a math class or just 
uh, science class or just computer science class. You need all these disciplines together um, uh, uh, as an integrative unit. And genomics is this authentic integration of all these disciplines together. Um, you need them all in order to basically do what, what Joe is doing and what Chris is, is going to talk to you about. And so uh, last semester, we were in the village community uh, school. And this school is amazing. Every single day, we had a class. And they started by just you know, extracting DNA. How does it look? How does DNA look? Right? And so then they, they got every time, they, they learned a little bit more. They, they learned about micropipetting. So we have all kinds of games that we get them engaged and get them to understand the importance of being very precise. Then they also learn um, uh, about the Menayan, about nanopore sequencing. They learn about how, how is this device constructed and why. So they really study these, um, uh, these flows to apply these samples um, very uh, accurately and precisely. And then the, the DNA of uh, the sequencing data flows onto their computer screens. Um, and they have to analyze it, these reads. And it's not two reads, it's not three reads, it's thousands of reads. So they need to basically um, uh, learn a little bit of, uh, of, of coding in order to basically analyze the data in a streamlined way in order to infer information from it. So this is Play DNA. It's all hands-on. Um, and so the, the students got this project, and it's called The Secret Life of Pickles. Um, and so they, they really uh, you know, started the, the, the fermentation of, uh, of cucumbers and followed it, and, and were doing the sequencing of the bacteria and followed the bacterial succession over time. And they all did that hands-on, got all these ATCs and Gs, and did a quantitative analysis. Um, and and this was, it was great fun. Um, okay, so the Play DNA curriculum, so we really design these curriculum, curricula for students, but we also design them for teachers. Um, because in the beginning, I already said, I, I didn't get a lot of genomics education or data science when I was um, in high school. And we can't expect teachers to know everything about these fields either. So we really have to design it in such a way that teachers are comfortable teaching it and are not afraid for this, this new field which sounds scary and complicated. Yeah, so we really, um, our aim is to make the next generation genomics and data literate. And um, we really would like, I would like to ask, you know, if you're a teacher um, or if you know teachers, please contact me. Um, I would love to sit down and learn what, what do you need in order to, um, uh, to, to effectively teach these kind of curricula. What, what are the barriers? I really would like to learn um, because we want to really make it that everybody wants to adopt it. Um, and here is our email address. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go back to middle school now. Um, so our last speaker uh, is, is Chris Mason. So Chris completed his uh, bachelor's in uh, genetics and biochemistry from uh, Wisconsin-Madison, his PhD from Yale, uh, postdoctorate uh, in Yale in clinical genomics, and was a postdoc uh, at Le Yale Law School. Uh, he's now a professor at, at Weill Cornell uh, and has appointments in Cornell, Rockefeller, and uh, apparently NASA. I'm not sure what we're going to hear about. And so we're really excited uh, to have Chris tell us about uh, what he's working on. Good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sophie and Joe, for the great intro to uh, what you all are doing. And I'm going to describe uh, some of the same ideas of what we're doing for ubiquitous genomics, but even thinking about places where it uh, touches on uh, maybe more surprising areas, or, or at least recently, that we've just been able to touch for the first time with sequencing. And so going from these small bits of sequencing reads of ACGT till eventually you can have uh, nice views of the atmosphere from space and how we're trying to expand, and actually just recently have uh, successfully expanded sequencing out uh, towards uh, actually in the space station. So I don't have a NASA appointment, I just have lots of grants from them, I guess. So it sort of counts, I guess. But, um, but I am very much an advocate and a passionate one about this simple slide. So NASA has stated goals, along with Elon Musk and others, to put boots on the ground on Mars by the year 2035. So we contribute a, a small degree of effort to this uh, at the genetic side for the human uh, the host response, what happens to the human body in space, which I'll tell you about, as well as what happens when we send things to Mars. Will we contaminate the planet? If so, with what? Uh, and then also, you know, can we actually do rapid diagnostics uh, in space? 
Unfortunately, in this artistic rendering, it appears that Mars is sucking all of the nutrients out of Earth. That is not the plan, I promise you. That is, uh, the goal is to have us on two planets, not leave here because we've destroyed it. It's really to, to go there and stay there. Um, that's just a rendering. So the way that we do this in my lab, it's a mixture of uh, uh, computational uh, genomics people as well as molecular biologists. So some people call it a, a wet and dry or hybrid lab, or some say humid lab, or some say armpit laboratory because it's kind of moist. Uh, you could say, but it's a mixture of people that have to bridge disciplines. So computational work must be, and in many cases is best when married with the genesis of the molecules that you're examining with your code. And so we have a, a large variety of projects that are very clinically focused, as well as some that are uh, focused on this big question, which I'll talk about tonight. And we also have some projects that will look globally at sequencing. So as you've heard, sequencing is now cheap enough and, and accurate enough to sequence really anything everywhere. One of the projects I want to tell you about is we, if you think about sending things to Mars, one of the big questions um, that we work on is called planetary protection. So uh, when we've, we've already sent essentially rovers to Mars, we're sending another one next year, another one in the year 2020. Uh, when we send things there, there's this big concern of, okay, what did, we, what did we send there? Have we contaminated Mars with some strange terrestrial microbes? And then eventually when we bring things back from Mars to Earth, probably by the year 2023, if we see DNA, how can we be sure that we didn't just bring something back? How do we know that we didn't contaminate the spacecraft and bring it back? And so there's, there's two ways we're addressing this, which I'll tell you about that use some of the minion and other sequencing. One of them is a, a global project uh, that looks actually at what's just present for the baseline. Uh, looking across cities around the world is a project called Metasub, which uses metagenomics, meaning all of the genomes that are present uh, of subways as well as urban biomes. And so this is a, a rendering of what happens once a year. We actually sample all of these cities around the world on the same day called Global, Global City Sampling Day. And so it's a citizen science project that looks at the snapshot, the genetic snapshot and map of our cities, uh, which has been ongoing since uh, 2015. And just this past summer, you can see, you can go to the website and look at each indi individual spot. And as you collect samples, you can see your spot show up on the map. And it is giving us basically uh, at least one version of a snapshot of all the DNA molecules, at least in the cities around Earth. And you can see we also got one guy who went to McMurdo Station down here in Antarctica. Um, their mass transit system is helicopters, so we swabbed down there as well. You can see right there. So also is, it includes uh, surface as well as water and air sampling. And so this is one where we're building and contributing to a global profile of what's on Earth. We also just this recently, a lot of you probably saw the eclipse. Uh, we actually worked with NASA and JPL for a microstrat project where it, when balloons were up in the uh, upper atmosphere, it's very much a Mars analog, so we attached uh, bacteria and samplers to collect what's in the atmosphere, and we just got them returned uh, about uh, three weeks ago, so during the eclipse, which is a very fun project. So we're in the process of sequencing everything that's in the atmosphere. The other thing we've been doing, as I alluded to, is this planetary protection question. So in the clean rooms where NASA builds their rovers, this is a picture of one of the, the satellites being constructed, uh, and this is actually the picture of what's going on the Mars 2020 rover. We're sequencing everything in that room, the HEPA filters, the surfaces, the engineers who are not happy about being swabbed, but we're sequencing, sequencing them as well, to see when we send this rover there in a few years, and then eventually there'll be a sample return mission, how sure are we that we didn't contaminate Mars or that we actually, if we do find life, how sure are we didn't, we didn't just bring it back? And so this is ongoing work. Again, this is not by myself. This is in collaboration with NASA and JPL and a lot of uh, great collaborators. So that's uh, some of the work that is building the snapshot of Earth. but. What I'm really excited about, uh, you know, outside of that, is actually what we're thinking about going and doing sequencing, not just on Earth, but going further from Earth eventually. And so the uh, space station is really, a, it's a national laboratory. So if you have ideas, you can submit them to NASA and say, I would like to send my cells into space. You're welcome to do so. You have to have a, a good idea as to why. But they take uh, solicitations and you can propose missions to them. Uh, so one of the months I proposed to them when I first started my lab in 2010 was, you know, astronauts. Wouldn't it be great if we could look at the changes to the human genome in space and also the other changes to the microbiome and other parts of your body? And I was fortunate that just after proposing that, they had also been putting together an RFA or a request for applications. Uh, in this case, with Mark and Scott Kelly, who are identical twins, where they were, uh, Scott was going to go up into space for a year and his twin brother was going to stay on Earth. So we had just a very unique opportunity to look at what's called uh, the twin study. And so for NASA's projects, what they do, the first thing they do is they come up with an acronym, and then they also have to make a patch, generally, for <laughs> all of their missions. So we, uh, this is actually an official patch. And here you can see there's DNA, and there's also epigenetic marks. I won't talk about this too much tonight, but epigenetics is very important as well. 
And a lot of this is going to be released uh, next year, but you, I can tell you already that some of the first hints of the stress of space travel have included that your telomeres actually get a little bit longer, so you have a little bit of the fountain of youth in space, but you also have large-scale uh, stress responses in your body, and you can actually see bone loss coming out of the urine, so you can actually see the body fighting to maintain its bone density and muscle mass, and it's an ongoing battle. They exercise every day. Uh, to maintain it, but also we see large changes in gene expression as well, so as you might expect. So I'm not going to talk about this too much other than to say um, this is what launched a lot of our work with NASA to think about this, but as we started working with NASA engineers, one big question came up that's relevant to classrooms as well. You know, what if we could just sequence in space? It's really a pain to bring all these samples back down to Earth, repatriate the samples. That's a verb I'd never used before, repatriate samples when they come back from Kazakhstan. Uh, but what if we could just sequence in space? So we started chatting with some of the NASA engineers and said, well, well you know, what we need to do that is a really small sequencer, the MinION, which you've heard about, and we need a way to get up there because at $10,000 per kilogram, you don't want a big sequencer, you need something small. And so this mission uh, that we launched with NASA, uh, again, of course, they needed a patch, so we got that <laughs> taken care of. Uh, you can see, the, again, the official patch, and there's a little MinION sequencer shooting into space. So uh, again, collaborations with Aaron Burton and also Charles Chu at UCSF. But as we started planning this mission about what we need, we need to get it certified that if the liquid leaks out and gets you in the eye that you won't lose your sight. We had to do toxicology tests. As we're planning this mission, and on one of the twins calls, uh, one of our resupply rockets blew up on the way to the space station. And so this was a very sad day. Uh, there were no personnel on, on board, but a lot of supplies and also uh, essentially some samples also that were going to be up there were all lost. But one of my favorite things about this rocket exploding, which is a weird sentence to have a favorite thing about Rock is exploding was though, I got this very touching letter from NASA saying, dear Dr. Mason, uh, you know, as Scott Kelly tweeted, Twitter now, as I'll remind you, is a presidential platform. So he tweeted, you know, space is hard, uh, you know, things blow up and we're sorry, but, you know, encourage you, I urge you to continue your inquiry, you know, don't lose hope, keep on it, you know, keep the faith. And I was very touched because oftentimes you don't get grants or you get grants that your budgets get cut. You don't get a letter, you know, maybe you get an email, there's no card, there's nothing. So. Uh, I was very touched by this, and so we started planning, uh, all right, we need to send up more supplies, but also what if we could test the min-ion and zero gravity before we send it to the space station? So we thought during one of the calls, well, could we try it on the parabolic flight simulator, which is also called the vomit comet, because almost everyone <laughs> pukes on the vomit comet. I do not have video of the puking. I, saw, I thought you wouldn't like that. But uh, in this case, one of the other twins investigators, Andy Feinberg, got the chance to get up there, and I said, all right, let's see if we can load the flow cell. So if any of you have done pipetting before, you normally want your tips to stay in place and you want generally all things to stay in place, but I think this might represent the hardest pipetting job ever because once you hit the zero G part of the flight, you can see what happens to all of your tips <laughs> and uh, they're not staying in place, so that makes it a little bit more challenging. He's using these new positive displacement pipettes that actually work in zero G though, so you can see they're working. We're pretty excited about that. Eventually though, the plane will get towards the port at the end of the parabolic flight and it will start to, everything will come back down, so you can see what happens there. And, uh, <laughs> And he's a good sport about it. But we did manage to actually load samples onto the flow cell. And it worked uh, for the first time as of like the October, uh, a couple years ago. We showed that it was possible. And you can see the paper eventually was published last year about seeing what happens when you're in geo zero G versus 1.8 G, zero G, 1.8 G during the parabolic flight. So we knew it was possible. And then we were fortunate that as Kate Rubens was training to be to head up to the space station, she was already a trained uh, um, molecular biologist and virologist, and she was the next astronaut to be able to go up uh, for the space program. So we went there and started training for loading the flow cell. Again, you know, if you can do it in space, you can certainly do it in the classroom, you can do it anywhere. And actually, it was able to load it with one flow cell. She made it up to the space station, no problem. Then the resupply mission also made it up, no problem. And actually, we got resupplies back up there. And you can see the booster return actually came back to Earth and landed on a platform in the water right here, which is pretty awesome, no problem there. And then so uh, last August in September, for the first time, we actually tried in zero gravity uh, to load the flow cells, which you can see here. Uh, NASA added this dramatic music. That was not me, just for the record. They, they, this is their official video. But you can see the first time uh, sequence data coming out from the flow cell. And so as of uh, last August, we knew it was possible to sequence DNA in space, and so it was very exciting. I mean, even if we had gotten it to work just a little bit, we would have been happy. But not only did it work, uh, it worked great enough to get a billion sequences coming from space. You can see here when we aligned it to the reference genome, we did mouse DNA, E. coli, and a phage. You can see here that at the time, this is actually pretty good for nanopore data. It was about 90% accurate for these what are called 2D reads, and they're actually much better even today. But this, this data from the, actually from space 
was even better than the data we got on Earth. We got longer reads, more data, higher accuracy data. So uh, one of the conclusions from the paper, which just recently got accepted last week, is that we should almost just do all of our genomics in space. It looks like it's better. We should just do everything up there. It's a little bit expensive, but uh, it's definitely better data because we had replicate libraries that we had in both places. So uh, the other thing we did is we took the DNA from these reads and wanted to stitch together the genomes to assemble the genome, much like you would do, say, you find a bacteria on Mars, or say you're on the space station, you have a weird infection, and you're like, I'd like to know what this thing is. I'd like to take a sample, sequence it, and assemble what bacteria it is. We showed it was possible to do it. Uh, here's the, PAC, the PacBio data versus the Oxford data oh, that was from space. And so this uh, represents really the first genome that was sequenced from data that was not made on this planet. It was just near this planet. Uh, and again, here's the preprint. You can read it there, and it's also going to be in press uh, very soon, or it's coming out soon. And so that's my uh, background and excitement on sequencing everywhere, including in space. And uh, I want to close with a thought of you know, where is it going? And I think some of the discussion that I've had with others as well as at NASA is, you know, what if we don't just detect things, but could you actually start engineering people to maybe even make the perfect astronaut, uh, you know, here represented, you know, from the movie Gattaca, you know, could you uh, actually engineer genomes or if you see genomes, uh, quickly measure them and respond to them on the space station or, or, you know, basically genetically protect astronauts before you send them to Mars. So you could engineer the skin microbiome, potentially the human genome. I was just um, at uh, the medical school this morning lecturing to medical students and Really, there's three, at least three areas where you might want to uh, engineer the human genome and maybe be ethically bound to engineer a human genome. So if you're an infertile couple, you could argue you'd have to either tell a couple you're not allowed to have a child, or you could say we could engineer it so you could. Or if you have a congenital uh, genetic disorder, where you actually want to avoid that. And the third instance, at least in my opinion, is that if you're sending humans to very far away planets, you'd want to give them every possible advantage you could because it's going to be hard for them to get back. So this is one argument where maybe we should both uh, give them physical defenses as well as genetic defenses and allow them, obviously, to sequence everything they come across. So this has led to, um, you know, could this astronaut then go to Mars? This is NASA's official omics poster where they talk about, you know, precision medicine, and you can see this astronaut. Again, something about their artistic rendering at NASA. They like it when things disintegrate or look like they're flying away from you, but that's uh, it's NASA. And you can see here there's also methylation on DNA and RNA. But the, the answer is very much yes. We think uh, in discussions with Oxford Danapur and with others that um, it would be possible to do sequencing for sure in space and then eventually even potentially on Mars in the future. So for all of you that are uh, really you know, my age or older, it's probably too late for us. We won't get there for another 20 or 25 years. But for any of you uh, younger members of the audience, you could actually start planning for this and you should apply to the astronaut program if you're so interested. So uh, at the end, I just want to thank everyone in the lab who makes all this work possible. And